So materials absorb energy when you heat them up. No surprise there. What else do they do? Well, they expand. Thermal expansion is something you're probably familiar with. They expand upon heating and they shrink upon cooling for most materials. And there are some interesting exceptions, but most materials, you heat them up, they expand. Cool them down, they shrink, okay? So we can quantify this. We can do it in a couple different ways. We can do it in a linear fashion or a volumetric fashion. Let's think about linear first. In a linear fashion, we're just gonna consider the length of a sample, right? This is it at temperature one, you heat it up, and now it's at temperature two, and it's expanded. So this is L final, and this was L initial. Some initial length, some final length. So we can calculate our thermal expansion. We're gonna take our L final minus our initial length, L zero, they call it there, is gonna be equal to the coefficient of thermal expansion, that's alpha L, right? We're calling it L because it's the linear coefficient of thermal expansion, multiplied by the difference in temperature. I labeled it T1 and T, so T2 minus T1, but it could be your final temperature minus your initial, right? So that's one way to think about it. But you could also do this on a volumetric basis, right? That the volume of your sample starts out smaller, and then when you heat it up, it got larger. This is obviously very exaggerated, right? And so you could take into account your final volume versus your initial volume, right? And you could calculate the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient. Both of those are possible, right? If your material is isotropic, meaning it expands equally in all three dimensions, then your, then your uh, volumetric thermal expansion coefficient will just be equal to three times your linear uh, thermal expansion coefficient. We've already talked about the origin of thermal expansion in terms of atomic bonding. The more tightly bound a material is, it has this really low um, bonding, binding energy, so really a really large value for binding energy in that it goes very, it's very negative. Then it tends to produce a symmetric potential energy well, right? This potential energy well is symmetric. Therefore, as you heat it up, it's not actually moving to the right very much. It's not, it's not expanding very much. But if it's weakly bound, then as you heat it up, it bends over quite a bit. Therefore, you get a lot of expansion for, some, for the same given temperature change, right? More commonly, what you'll see, though, is actually measurements of this. So you can do measurements of strain as you heat a material up. It's pretty cool how they do this. They use what's called a dilatometer. It takes your sample, it stands it up in a furnace, and it basically connects it to a really sensitive ruler. A little sensitive ruler touches down on your sample, and as you heat your material up, the material grows, right? It gets a little bit bigger, and so your ruler got pushed up a little bit. Kind of crazy that you can actually do this. We have something sense enough to do that, sensitive enough to do that, but we do. We have tools that can make that happen. So then you can plot your strain as a function of temperature, and there's different ways of reporting thermal expansion. You could do the average value, meaning you just take your initial uh, position, your final position, and you're taking the change in, in getting there, right? Your final strain at some temperature was there, so between this temperature, say 400 and whatever that is, 70, you could calculate the change in your length, right? Your strain, again, would be delta L over L would equal thermal expansion linear times delta T. So to solve for linear thermal expansion, you'd literally be taking just your strain, dividing it by delta T, or the slope of that line right there, right? That's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it would be to provide the instantaneous thermal expansion. So at any given point, right, you could take the tangent line, like right here, at that temperature, we could figure out the slope and I could give you the instantaneous thermal expansion at that temperature, right? And obviously that's gonna change if this is not a linear thermal expansion material. And many materials aren't linear, uh, some are, okay? So that's the difference between instantaneous versus average thermal expansion. Uh, we already talked about the asymmetric potential energy well. Well, how about some typical values? Well, for metals, thermal expansion is probably gonna be something like five to 25 parts per million per K. So for every one degree Kelvin, it's going to increase by five or five to 25 parts per million range, right? Remember that a parts per million is just the same as saying that it's times 10 to the negative six, right? Now there are some metals that can be designed to have low thermal expansion, right? For example, one material is called Kovar. It's an alloy of iron and nickel, or they'll add some cobalt to it as well. The point is, is that it has a thermal expansion of about one parts per meter per Kelvin, which is really low for a metal. And they do that on purpose because they want it to match the thermal expansion of glass. Borosilicate glass, that basically matches the coefficient of thermal expansion. 
And that's going to lead us to have a material that is robust even as it gets cycled from high to low temperatures because it's not going to fracture due to a mismatch in thermal expansion. Mismatch in thermal expansion is a big deal. We'll talk about that in just a moment when we get to thermal, strength, uh, thermal stress. Okay. Um, what about ceramics? Ceramics typically have lower thermal expansions, and that makes sense because, again, ceramics versus metals versus polymers, we know that ceramics are the strongest bonds, right? They go down the lowest, right? Ceramics are there, metals are there, and polymers would be there. Therefore, you would expect ceramics to have the lowest thermal expansion, then metals would be higher, and polymers would be the highest, and that's what we see. What else can we see about ceramics? Um, they tend to be isotropic for glasses, meaning they expand equally in all directions, right? Because it's, it's a disordered structure, it's not a uh, crystalline structure. Um, it is possible for some ceramics to expand in one direction, but shrink in another. There's some interesting ceramics that'll do that. Um, a really important material in terms of ceramics and thermal conductivity is just quartz, right? Pure silica has a very, very low thermal expansion coefficient. In fact, it's almost zero. If you plot it, uh, I think it actually goes slightly negative and then it comes up just a little bit, but it's basically zero over a really broad range. It's so cool, you can actually take it, you can get it white hot with a torch, like an oxygen torch, dunk it right into a bucket of water and it won't fracture, whereas many other materials would undergo thermal shock, which we'll show you, we'll talk about in just a moment, but they would fracture, okay? Um, and then polymers, the last thing about polymers is that the thermal expansion can be quite large. We're talking about 50 to 400 parts per million per K, um, and this is just because they're so weakly bonded. It's that interchain bonding is really easy um, to cause separations in those weak bonds. Um, and then if you cross-link your ceramic like a, like a rubber that's been crossing, vulcanized rubber, then you typically reduce the coefficient of thermal expansion. 